For some, it was the defining moment of the 20th century. But despite overwhelming evidence, a small group of fanatical conspiracy theorists refuses to accept that we landed men on the moon. They continue to create new conspiracy theories which get more and more outlandish as their old ones are disproved. Apollo 11, this is Houston. You are go for TLI, over. Every reputable member of the scientific community agrees the Apollo landings were real. We confirm ignition and the thrust is go. In this video, we will focus on the most convincing evidence of multiple landings on the moon. Apollo 11, this is Houston at one minute. According to the astronauts, the soil on the surface was very fine and powdery. This appears to be obvious when viewing the high quality Hasselblad photos. In this photo from Apollo 17, notice how the surface dust clings to the astronaut's boot. This is a good indicator of just how fine grained the dust would have to be. Conspiracists have said these shots were actually taken on planet Earth, meaning the soil shown would have to be either sand or dirt. Let's first take a look at their claims that the photos show regular sand. First, beach sand does not retain precise shapes like those seen in the Apollo bootprints. Our technical advisor, Sat Weavers, shot these test photos on a dry California beach. Notice what a poor job the sand does at preserving his footprint. Comparing these two shots, you can see the Apollo photos would have been impossible to replicate using ordinary sand. The reason is that sand grains on planet Earth have been rounded off through thousands of years of erosion and oxidation. Therefore, they have no means of sticking to one another, and detailed prints are not possible. So, if the soil could not be sand, conspiracists are forced to admit it is dirt, or, dust. For a conspiracist who believes all Apollo videos and stills were shot on planet Earth, this position is a dangerous one. If this were the case, the soil they must now admit is very fine, would billow up into the air, when disturbed, creating lingering clouds of dust. For anyone who has ever driven down a dusty gravel road, or, been exposed to volcanic ash, this fact is well known. So, if the Apollo scenes were all filmed on planet Earth, with regular old dirt, as the conspiracy theorists insist, where, are the dust clouds? As you can see from these original Apollo videos, when the dust is disturbed, it falls immediately to the ground. In the hours upon hours of Apollo lunar footage, not a single frame has ever shown a dust cloud. Watch, as David Scott from Apollo 15, loses his balance. The spray of dust he kicks up, completely settles in only a fraction of a second. In this clip of Apollo 15 touching down, watch as the dust kicked up by the engine exhaust, settles immediately. After the engine is shut off, because air suspends dust particles, the only way to achieve this result would be to shoot where there is no air at all. But, where could there be a vacuum chamber large enough to hold all the astronauts with their gear, lunar module, lunar rovers, and acres of open space to roam around freely? The only possible answer is 240,000 miles away on the moon. This piece of evidence alone proves with great certainty that the Apollo scenes could not have been filmed on planet Earth. 
Understandably, this is the one topic hoax advocates hate to debate more than any other. Hey fellas, we're able to see the Earth with your big eye there. When Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin performed their first moonwalk, they planted an American flag in the lunar soil. How is the quality of the TV? Oh, it's beautiful, Mike. Conspiracy advocates love these videos because they say the waving flag is proof that air was present when it was shot. Indeed, they've got the flag up now and you can see the stars and stripes on the lunar surface. In reality, this original Apollo 11 footage proves just the opposite. If you pay close attention to the flag itself, you'll notice that it only moves when the astronauts are moving it, as they attempt to push the pole into the ground. On board the lunar module was a 16mm movie camera called the Data Acquisition Camera. The image you see in the upper left is the actual film footage taken with that camera. This camera ran continually as it recorded the flag raising and the activities that followed. What we are going to do is play this sequence starting from the point where Neil and Buzz are setting up the flag. The data acquisition camera ran at 6 frames per second instead of the normal 24. This is why the footage appears choppy. Just for fun, let's try to speed things up just a bit. You are now seeing the action three times faster than it actually happened. This is the point where the astronauts are trying to make the flagpole go into the ground. It flaps around loosely as they move and twist the pole. Conspiracy believers have said this movement is caused by a breeze. But as we're about to demonstrate, the flag does not flap unless the astronauts are moving it. The scene you are now watching was originally over 40 minutes long as recorded by the data acquisition camera. We have not edited this footage in any way other than changing the playback speed. From this point onward, the flag is untouched. To help illustrate a point, watch as we increase the speed to 3600% of the original. By doing this, we've taken a continuous 37 minute segment and squeezed it down to a single minute. During this time lapse sequence, keep your eye on the flag. Do you see it move? If this scene were filmed in an air filled environment, the flag would show at least a little movement either from an outdoor gust of wind, or air movement caused by the astronauts as they strolled past. If you remember, the flag flapped easily when the pole was twisted, so we know it's not made of some heavy material that's resistant to puffs of air. To make a flag behave this way on planet Earth would be a complete impossibility. Conspiracists usually love to cite the flag footage as evidence for their cause until they realize the flag never moves by itself. Almost from the first moment Neil Armstrong put his foot in the lunar soil, some people have expressed doubts about whether the moon landings were real. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. For the most part, the controversy was limited to some occasional barroom chat or water cooler gossip. But only five years after the first Apollo landing, a book was published that created a groundswell of interest with people who had doubts about NASA's lunar program. 
The book was titled, We Never Went to the Moon. It was published in 1974 by William Kiesing, who is known as the grandfather of the lunar hoax conspiracy movement. In his book, he laid the groundwork for what would become the conspiracy crowd's primary arguments against NASA's official version of events. Kiesing's major points included the lack of stars in photos, the waving flag, and his assertion that NASA used brainwashing and outright murder to silence whistleblowers. He died in April 2005, at the age of 82. Another outspoken hoax advocate is Ralph Renee, who resides in Scottsburg, Indiana. He is a self-described, brilliant lay physicist. Besides denying the validity of the Apollo landings, Rene also insists that the moon should fall into the sun, and that all rock cliffs over 1,000 feet tall should collapse. On his website, he predictably makes all his publications available, for a price, including a pamphlet that states the 9-11 attacks were an inside job, planned and executed by the US government. Interestingly, he also has a selection of fiction books for sale. Rene was featured on a recent Penn & Teller episode, in which they were investigating conspiracy theories. In the show, he stubbornly clung to many of the standard hoax arguments, which have been around since William Casing's book. All of them have been thoroughly explained by NASA and the scientific community at large. With the advent of the Internet, many conspiracy believers have found a new audience for their points of view. There are many vocal proponents of the moon hoax theory in news groups like Alt Conspiracy and video upload sites like YouTube. Many of these conspiracists are following in the footsteps of Mr. Kazing and Ralph Rene by advancing their own agendas based on their faulty interpretation of NASA data. Often, however, their proposals cannot withstand even slight scrutiny. This individual recently published a theory about rock shadows. When our producer proved his theory was wrong, in an online forum, his message was promptly removed, and all his future posts were censored. In our research for this program, it has become clear that many of the anti-NASA people will act quickly to censor any new evidence which hurts their case. This would seem to suggest that their positions are tenuous, at best. One of the newest advocates for the anti-NASA movement is an independent filmmaker named Bart Sibrell. Mr. Sibrell gained notoriety in 2002 when he was punched in the face by Buzz Aldrin after aggressively confronting him and blocking his path. Sibrell sued, but the judge dismissed the case and ruled that Aldrin was justified in punching him. In a recent radio interview, Mr. Sibrell said this about the incident. You know, when I got punched by Buzz Aldrin, it was because I walked up to him and asked him to swear on the Bible that he walked on the moon. Let's hear it one more time. I walked up to him and asked him to swear on the Bible. Now let's roll the video with sound and see if that's actually the way it happened. You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. Calling the kettle black if I ever thought of saying I misrepresented get it myself. Away from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. Did you get that on camera? Prior to the Aldrin incident, he worked as a part time cameraman for an NBC affiliate in Nashville, Tennessee. After being arrested for trespassing on Neil Armstrong's property, he was promptly fired. On his website, Mr. Sibrell claims to have won several top awards from the American Motion Picture Society. We looked up Mr. Sibrell on the organization's website, but search results turned up no record of him. He also claims to have national credits for films with NBC, Fox, CNN, The Nashville Network, Lifetime, and BET. A review of the Internet Movie Database, however, only lists a single credit for Mr. Sibrell. His Apollo hoax DVD, entitled A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon. He sells the video online for $29.95. It has received mostly bad reviews. In this DVD, Sibrell makes a number of remarkable claims. Among them, 
that the Van Allen radiation belts which surround Earth, would be lethal to astronauts. What Mr. Sibrell does not reveal in this video, is what James Van Allen had to say about the very belts which are named in his honor. After a Fox television special aired in 2001, dealing with the lunar hoax theory, Dr. Van Allen had this to say. Recent Fox TV show which I saw is an ingenious and entertaining assemblage of nonsense. The claim that radiation exposure during the Apollo missions would have been fatal to the astronauts is only one example of such nonsense. To market his video, Sibrell uses an intriguing selling point. He says the film contains lost footage, which NASA sent to him by mistake. In fact, this so-called lost footage was placed in the public domain by NASA many years ago and is freely available as part of a DVD set by Spacecraft Films. In the Sibrel DVD, he accuses the Apollo astronauts of using camera trickery to fake a shot of Earth from 130,000 miles out to achieve a disingenuous picture depicting the Earth at a distance in order to falsely demonstrate their far journey from it. And On their way to the moon, the Apollo 11 astronauts made three television broadcasts. The first two were unscheduled and were intended primarily to allow them to get familiar with the camera controls. And how about the F-stop? Uh, is 22 going to be adequate? The third broadcast was scheduled and seen by millions watching on their TV sets. The Sibrel DVD contains footage from this public broadcast. It looks good on the monitor as far as... Therefore the DVDs claim that it is never before seen footage is a complete fabrication. In a funny thing happened, the narrator makes many false assumptions. Here is one example. If the window was completely filled up with a TV camera, as he stated, then an astronaut's arm would not be able to get between the camera and the window, as it obviously does here in this outtake. <laughs> then an astronaut's arm would not be able to get between the camera and the window, as it obviously does here in this outtake. The arm, the narrator refers to, is actually just the edge of the command module's window, through which Buzz Aldrin was shooting his video of Earth. The window was identical to this example from Apollo 7. Notice the straight vertical edges. This will become important, a bit later. Now listen, as the narrator explains how the astronauts are supposedly faking their shot of Earth, from halfway to the moon. What they have ingeniously done, is placed the camera at the back of the spacecraft, and centered the lens on a circular window in the foreground, outside of which it is completely filled with the Earth in low orbit. The circumference of the window then appears to be the diameter of the Earth at a distance, with the darkened walls of the spacecraft appearing to be the blackness of space around it. That Easily the most controversial statement on his Funny Thing Happened DVD, Sibrell is claiming that the astronauts were actually in low Earth orbit. And the image of Earth shown here, is the near Earth, filling up a round porthole window in the spacecraft. He then says the astronauts blocked out all light so the inside of the porthole would not be visible. And a new, distant Earth, is formed. It sounds good to a casual observer, but there are several major problems with this statement. First, if you'll remember back to the previous segment, the window Buzz Aldrin was shooting through, was square. Not round. Second, if they really were in low Earth orbit, the Earth would be moving by quite fast, instead of the relatively static image shown in Apollo 11. Notice how different these videos of Earth, from a recent space shuttle mission would look, through our virtual porthole. Notice how the Earth's rotation can be easily seen, even in the short clip. Now compare this cropped image of Earth from 220 miles up, to the Apollo images Sibrel and his team want us to believe, are from the same low orbit. If Apollo 11 is as close to Earth as Sibrel states, why is there no rotation, commensurate with that altitude, in the Apollo video? Our technical advisor, Sat Weavers, also created these test images. They show how a cropped Earth would look, if shot from low orbit. 
These images were taken only minutes apart, yet they show huge changes in surface features. Something that is noticeably missing from the Apollo videos. The, the, Western US. the reason is obvious. Earth's rotation is much less noticeable when viewed from 130,000 miles away. Take note of how Buzz Aldrin is holding the video camera in his hands. He is moving back and forth inside a zero-g capsule, all while trying to keep Earth in frame. Naturally, the situation lends itself to a lot of camera movement. It is because of this camera movement that their hypothesis falls apart. Think about what you're seeing. With the camera shaking and constantly changing positions, would the artificial horizon, created by a round window, remain in the same place, or would it move, revealing different parts of the Earth? We decided to do a test and find out. For this demonstration, a lighted globe was put in position, behind a piece of cardboard with a hole cut out. Then, all the room lights were turned out, to simulate the conditions inside the command module. Our new view of Earth, was then videotaped. The black cardboard represents the inside of a spacecraft, and the hole represents the porthole window Aldrin was supposedly shooting through. As you can see, our cropped image of the globe looks quite good. But when the camera begins to move around, as it did when Aldrin was shooting, something interesting happens. Notice how the artificial horizon created by our makeshift porthole, now changes its position in relation to the rest of the globe. As the camera moves, less of Earth is revealed on one side, and more is revealed on the opposite side. As shown here, the entire continent of Australia, completely disappears, with only a few inches of camera movement. If Aldrin really had been shooting Earth in low orbit, through a porthole window, his camera movements would have shown the same effect. Clearly, this is not the case. Author David Percy, is a colleague of Bart Sibrel, and also an Apollo conspiracist. It was also found by a fellow TV producer and Apollo researcher, Bart Sibrel. It's interesting to note, that he apparently agrees with us, when it comes to the pitfalls of shooting through a porthole, with a handheld camera. It would be difficult to keep the subject well framed. As you can see from this illustration, the Earth in the far distance would be cut off by the window in the foreground when any movement of the camera occurred. <laughs> We've ringed the edge of the window white for clarity. Remember, it was handheld. For further proof, Sat Weavers obtained these more recent photos of Earth, taken by the Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite, or GOES, for short. Remember, Bart Sibrel states quite confidently, that the image Apollo 11 showed of Earth, was actually just a smaller area, of a much larger planet. But in analyzing these whole Earth images, from the GOES weather satellite, striking similarities with the original Apollo 11 video can be seen. Some weather patterns are common on planet Earth, such as the band of clouds diagonally traversing the Pacific, creating the same arrowhead shape seen in the Apollo video, from 1969. The scale and shape of these cloud patterns, taken some 35 years apart, add strong new evidence that we actually are seeing the entire Earth, in the images shot by the Apollo crew. Taking into account all the evidence just presented, low orbit earth rotation velocity, shooting with the handheld camera, and cloud pattern comparisons. It can be confidently stated that Bart Sibrel's porthole theory is, unequivocally, busted. As we just learned, David Percy is another well-known moon hoax advocate. Along with Mary Bennett, he wrote a book called, Dark Moon. Despite fighting for the same cause, Mr. Percy does not agree with Zibrell, about his porthole theory. Instead, he believes the Apollo 11 crew, used a transparency, taped to the command module window, to fake the now famous footage of Earth. When it's clipped up against the window, it becomes illuminated by the light of the sun behind it. 
Okay, Lava, we have a picture. We see the Earth right in the center of the screen, over. Listen, as Percy describes his version of what happened. Returning to the sequence where we left off, when the lights have been switched on, the other window shade opens and the exposure adjusted, we can see astronaut Mike Collins. The left-hand window we've just been looking at is now overexposed, but as we get closer, we can see that something is indeed clipped in front of the window. Is it that window size color transparency of the Earth, with the sunlight glowing white behind it? It looks very much so. Why would they need to be videoing a picture of the Earth? Percy is speculating that the bluish haze we're seeing here is a transparency of Earth clipped to the window. In fact, it's nothing more than overexposed Earth light being diffused by a three-pane window. The side windows in the Apollo Command Module consist of three panes of glass with a large nitrogen-filled space between the outer pane and the second pane. These windows were notorious for collecting film deposits and fogging. This helps explain the refraction of Earth light seen in the Apollo 11 video. Through his extensive research, Sat Weavers also discovered that the fused silica used for the outer panes had a blue-red spectral filter coating. This coating shifted the blue earth light coming through, even more toward the blue end of the spectrum. Couple the window's diffusing properties with the fact that an already bright earth was greatly overexposed when Aldrin opened the camera lens. And Percy's mysterious transparency is revealed for what it actually is. Just overexposed, refracted, earth light. One example of this diffusion effect can be seen here from the same mission. Watch as the camera's iris is opened just a little. When the lens was opened all the way, the scattering effect was more pronounced. To some, this looked like a transparency. Others saw it as Earth in low orbit. As just demonstrated, it was neither. During Apollo 11's voyage to the moon, the crew made several TV broadcasts, showing Earth in the far distance. To further analyze Percy's transparency theory, we've taken still frames from these broadcasts, and compared the images of Earth, at various time intervals. Remember, Percy makes the bold claim, that we're actually seeing a static transparency of Earth, taped to the window. If this is true, Earth's surface features should not change over a given span of time. Our first comparison is from the first TV broadcast, about 10 hours and 32 minutes into the flight. These two images were shot about 15 minutes apart. Look closely as we switch the images. The change is most obvious across the Terminator line as nighttime gradually moves westward. Next, we have a comparison from the third transmission at 34 hours into the mission. The time lapse here is approximately 18 minutes. Since Earth rotates at over 1000 miles an hour, there will be slight differences visible even from 130,000 miles away. Finally, compare our first shot of Earth from 10 and a half hours into the mission to an image taken almost 24 hours later. Remember, Percy says all these images are from a static transparency, which obviously cannot move. So if we've just been looking at a still photo the entire time, why is Earth showing clear signs of rotation? We asked Mr. Percy this question. His response was that different transparencies were used. However, these videos of Earth were one continuous shot with no edits, so it would not have been possible to insert a new transparency. Given the fact that the mystery transparency turned out to be nothing more than overexposed Earth light, and signs of Earth rotation are very obvious. It can be confidently stated that David Percy's transparency theory is, unequivocally, busted. In researching this documentary, hours and hours of footage from the Apollo missions were analyzed. In viewing the NASA video reels, we noticed something quite unusual. If you remember, it was stated earlier that Apollo 11 sent three TV transmissions back to Earth during their trip to the moon. 
The first one came at 10 hours and 32 minutes into the flight. The last one came at 33 hours and 59 minutes in. Bart Sibrell and David Percy both show clips from these two transmissions in their respective videos. But wait! There was another TV transmission, at 30 hours and 28 minutes, mission time. Curiously, not a single frame of it was used, in Bart Sibrell's DVD, or David Percy's documentary. In fact, they don't even mention it. We wondered, why this particular video was not included in their productions. Until we viewed it. And the answer became clear. Keep in mind, Bart Sibrell assures us, we are seeing a cropped version of Earth, through a tiny porthole. And David Percy says, we are seeing a photograph of Earth, taped to the window. Watch now, and you'll discover the clear reason, neither of them wanted to show this TV transmission from Apollo 11, at 3028, mission time. It's important to note, the shot never, cuts away.
If we really went to the moon, then anyone who says otherwise is an idiot. at all.